I saw a Tea Party rally sign in Washington, D.C. last summer. I feel like we should have it here that I'm not a racist, but I play one on MSNBC. <laughs> thank you for having me, uh, and thanks to Steve for the introduction. I, I was going to tell you about Samuel Prescott. Uh, Dr. Samuel Prescott, who probably none of you have ever heard of. He should be the patron saint of the Tea Party movement. You know, the, the Tea Party movement nationally, you have what, you've got the, the Tea Party Express, you've got the Tea Party Patriots, you've got the National Tax Day Tea Party, you've got the Amalgamated Federation of Concerned Union of Tea Party, Activist Patriot Express of America, LLC, and Inc. Uh, and they get all the glory and all the credit, and, and the local Tea Party activists around the country don't get the credit that the national guys get when they're not busy suing each other. You guys are the ones who actually get out and go door to door, who give money, who show up, who rally, who go not just to Washington, but go to City Hall, go to the County Commission. It's the local Tea Party movement that makes the impact. Samuel Prescott, Dr. Samuel Prescott, was walking home from a party at 1 o'clock in the morning. It was 1775, early 1776, uh, January, I believe. A lot of snow on the ground. And he heard a horse come up behind him was a guy you might have heard of named Paul Revere, saying that the British were coming. It was a very cold night at one o'clock in the morning, and while Samuel Prescott was there, Paul Revere told him what the problem was, and went on to the next town. And Samuel Prescott stayed behind and went door to door in the town and rallied every individual citizen in the town to let them know the British were coming. And his town was ready when the British came. No one knows Samuel Prescott, like the local Tea Party activists. No one knows the local Tea Party activists, but they're the people who stay behind and rally the crowd and get them out. And they're the ones who are subjected now to the government in Washington, Republicans, Democrats alike. The Republicans don't like the Tea Party activists any more than the Democrats like the Tea Party activists because the Republicans are just as likely to be beaten by a Tea Party activists as the Democrats, which is a good thing. And so Samuel Prescott should be the patron saint of the Tea Party movement. I was going to spend a lot more time on him, but I, this morning I read the Washington Post. I don't normally read the Washington Post. It's bad for your health. But I read the Washington Post, and there was a profile of Heather Penny. They call her Lucky Penny. She's a captain in the Air Force on 9-11. She was at Andrews Air Force Base. Two planes had hit the tower. One had hit the Pentagon and United 93 was on its way to Washington. And they put her in her plane and got her out to the runway and they told her to bring down United 93. They didn't put any weapons on the plane. She was the weapon. And she, a captain in the Air Force, flying an F-16, was willing to fly her plane into United 93 and kill herself and everyone on that plane to save her country. And she is an American hero for doing it. And we remember people like that this weekend. But then there are the Samuel Prescotts of the world. There, there are the American citizens who they care for their country and they're concerned about the direction of the country. And they want to take their country back, not from the Democrats and not from the Republicans. They want to take their country back from Washington itself. The states are not administrative agencies of Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is supposed to be administrative agency of the states. It is Washington. There are 18 things in Article I of the Constitution that Congress has the power to do. Beyond that, none. And yet, for some reason, we think that Washington, D.C., everything should come from Washington. Why does Washington have to solve our health care problem? Why does Washington have to solve our schools problem? It seems the more Washington gets involved in our schools, the worse our schools are. Amen. The more Washington is involved in our health care, the more expensive it is. Do you know the rate, the number of uninsured Americans has gone up 20% since Obamacare passed? Because insurance companies are going out of business. Businesses don't want to put people in their insurance. Businesses don't want to hire because they have no idea what their costs are going to be in two years. And so we have the President of the United States give a speech on Thursday night that within five minutes of being over, everyone's talking about something else. Jobs, 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 he says. He says jobs, jobs, jobs in 2009, 2010, January 2011, and Thursday night. No one believes what this guy's saying. 
He doesn't know how to create jobs. The only jobs he's created are government jobs or jobs dependent on the government. He doesn't understand the free market. He doesn't understand the private sector. He doesn't understand liberty. And unfortunately, there aren't a lot of Americans these days anymore who understand what liberty really is. We talk a lot about freedom in the country, freedom to do this, freedom to do that. No one talks about liberty anymore. The last I read the Declaration of Independence, it didn't say life, freedom, and pursuit of happiness. It said life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So what's the difference? Freedom is this great big concept. You got the freedom to go to Kroger or Publix. You got the freedom to go to CVS or Walgreens. You got the freedom to speak or not to speak. You got the freedom of the press or not. What is liberty? The best idea I can give you of liberty is, is Abraham Lincoln, who the president apparently informed us is the founder of the Republican Party, even though he didn't join until two years after the Republican Party was actually founded. By the way, today PBS has altered the president's transcript from Thursday night to strip out the little line where he said Abraham Lincoln was the founder of the Republican Party. It doesn't exist anymore at PBS, the government-run media operation. So Abraham Lincoln in 1856 actually went to campaign for the very first Republican presidential candidate. He traveled by horseback for two weeks to talk to a crowd of about a thousand, went from Springfield Illinois to Kalamazoo, Michigan, and 10,000 people showed up for a crowd of 1,000. Now, they tell me that back in the day when there were no automobiles and no airplanes, that you can actually hear without a microphone, a crowd of 10,000 people could hear of. The world was quieter back then. And Abraham Lincoln gave probably the best idea of what liberty actually means. He said, in this country, and it's still in its infancy, Unlike any other country on earth, the reason we're the envy of the world is because in this country, unlike any other, every man can make himself. And that's quintessentially the definition of liberty. In this country, you have a freedom beyond the freedom of choice. You have a freedom beyond the freedom of speech. You have the freedom to be left alone by your government. You have the freedom to opt into your government. You don't have to go vote. You know, we're an anomaly in the world. Most countries you get compelled by the government to go vote. In Australia, you get fined if you don't go vote. In Belgium, you get fined if you don't go vote. In France, you get fined if you don't go vote. In this country, I would encourage people not to go vote if they don't know what the heck is going on. Yeah. Frankly, we've got 47% of the country taking money from Washington and not sending money to Washington. I would really encourage those people not to vote. I mean, I realize it's a radical notion these days, but when you reach a point in the country where a majority of people are getting stuff without having to contribute to society, your society starts to go downhill very rapidly. It's just, a, we've lost something in this country. In, in the 1960s, in the Great Society, we went from talking about the, the needy, the deserving poor. Lyndon Johnson decided that we would talk about the poor in general, so we don't distinguish anymore between the poor who we as a society have an obligation to help and the poor who had a run of bad luck and they for some reason want us to bail them out. No, you know, this country is about taking risks. When the first Americans went through the Cumberland Gap, the government was not there to save them when their wagon got stuck. When the first Americans went out onto the Great Plains to build houses in an area of the country, they had no idea what the weather was going to be like. Horrible storms in the summer, horrible cold in the winter. They didn't have Uncle Sam there to give them a bailout on their sod farm. When Lewis and Clark went across the country, they didn't have the government there to pay for their needs and supplies while they were there. Yeah, it was a government-funded expedition, but while they were there, they were rugged individualists. They depended on American Indians. They depended on other frontiersmen. We as a society these days, I mean, the government tells us what sort of light bulb to put in our house. They, they're about to tell us what sort of toilet paper to use. They're about to get rid of two-ply toilet paper. The government tells us what sort of cars we need to drive, how fuel efficient they need to be. The government tells us things the government shouldn't have to tell us. It should be common sense. We have legislated away common sense and said what Washington says is what goes. Who cares what the rest of us say? We have completely removed government from the closest people and sent it to Washington, D.C. I don't know about you, but I've been to Washington, D.C. plenty of times. Not even the Republicans there knows what goes on outside of Washington, D.C. Secularstupidist.com, conservative.com, rightosophy.com.